So, um, so Joseph is the founder of Pneumatic, which is the enterprise company behind Kubernetes, which is now at Prenda. Um, he's also the founder of KubeCon, for anyone who has gone already, both the one in the US and the one in Europe. And he flew all the way from San Francisco to be here with us today. Thanks um, for having me. He will be talking about, so he's splitting his time now between Rook and starting his another project. Uh, so he'll be talking about Rook. Okay. Cool. So Thank you, Margarita. Cool. Cool. Thank you for having me. It's great to, to be here in the Source D offices. This is very San Francisco with like the pizza area and all the cool <laughs> facades and everything. So congratulations on creating such a cool space. Um, so yeah, it's great to be here in, in Madrid. I, I haven't been here in five or six years, so it's, it's nice to explore the city a little bit for a couple days uh, before Berlin next week, which is KubeCon Europe this year. Uh, yeah, as uh, Margarita said, I'm focusing uh, uh, my time, a little bit of my time on Rook, which is a, a very exciting new cloud-native uh, distributed object block file storage project. Uh, I'll be talking a little bit about that and uh, not, 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 not going to go incredibly low level and detailed into I.O. device drivers, uh, schedulers, and the Linux kernel, um, but it certainly is heavily using a lot of those, so I think it's a, a, a good follow-up talk from uh, from the really great one that we just heard about, all the different uh, st storage persistence options and, uh, and all the sort of paths of actually doing a, a write in Linux. So just a little bit about me first. Um, I spent about 13 years working for a bunch of different startups. Uh, over the last five or six years, wor worked uh, for a few companies in the middleware, SOA kind of space, uh, cloud, and uh, I worked uh, at Mesosphere as a consultant in 2014. And then when Kubernetes came out, I got very excited about that project uh, with a couple of folks I met there, started a company around it. And that's kind of the sort of the crazy last couple of years of my life have been mostly spending on, on Kubernetes. Uh, started a company, uh, was involved in the CNCF pretty early on. So this is the Cloud Native Computing Foundation where, where Kubernetes was donated to by Google. And um, started KubeCon. Uh, we donated KubeCon to the Linux Foundation and the, and the CNCF, which, which actually manages and and uh, maintains uh, and, and handles that, that event now. And with they have professional staff and like really awesome people that make that, that event happen. So congratulations to, to them for making it grow and, and be a huge event. Uh, next week in Berlin, Germany, we have KubeCon Europe that's happening this year. So typically every year there's a European event and a North American uh, uh, sort of United States event. And uh, you know, this year is going to be the biggest yet. I think every year we'll break the, the barriers of attendance from the years prior. Um, and so I think uh, to, you know, all totaled, uh, many thousands of people are going to attend uh, across Berlin and Austin later, later in Texas in December of this year. Um, so pretty excited about that. Um, I uh, left Apprenda about a month ago, which is the company that uh, acquired Kismatic. And they're a platform as a service company. They're, they're doing a lot of really cool work. Um, I got the itch to, to do another startup, and so um, decided to, to take a little bit of time off. And in, in, in that time, had uh, started to explore lots of different open source projects. One of them that stood out to me that was very exciting and interesting, kind of solving one of the big problems in distributed storage for these sort of modern container-based applications that people are building, uh, is a project called Rook. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit about Rook. Uh, I'm very active on Twitter. I love talking with people all over the world on Twitter. Um, and I think Twitter's amazing just for like staying in touch with things and cha changes in the world. So if you want to follow me, I'm async.io on Twitter. Um, so just to kind of talk about the outline, um, we'll be introducing Rook, uh, kind of explaining wh what the project is all about, why it exists, and why you might use it, why, why it might be interesting to you. Um, we'll talk about the operator uh, scenarios and patterns that exist in Rook. So you can actually use something that um, makes Rook really easy to uh, deploy and lifecycle on top of Kubernetes specifically. I know Ivan, uh, uh, my friend, uh, talked a little bit about operators earlier in the day. Unfortunately, I missed, missed your talk. I'm sure I'll watch the recording later. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about other operators that have been built. Um, so CoreOS is a, is a company doing awesome work in this, in this space. They kind of came up with this idea of operators, which is this sort of automation uh, methodology around sort of the life cycle of different distributed services on Kubernetes that are, that are uh, typically stateful services. Um, but they can also be really useful for, for stateless ser services. Uh, feel free to interrupt me at any time during the talk with, with questions. Um, happy to take questions at the end as well. So from, from myself, I actually have a few questions. So who, who has heard of? Uh, or use, uh, uses Kubernetes uh, today in the, in, the, in the audience. So 
almost everybody has either heard of it or used it. Who, who, who's actually like using the system today or is pretty heavily investing in it in your, in your company or in your startup? Wow, cool. It's about five or six people. Uh, I know, Ivan, you're using it in production. Anyone else using Kubernetes in production in the audience? Just, just raise your hand. You'll look really cool if you just like to say, I use Kubernetes in production. But still, four or five people. That's awesome. Um, uh, what about Rook? Has anyone, prior to this talk or this sort of event, has anyone heard of Rook before? A couple people. OK, awesome. So that's my census. Um, so what is Rook? Rook is uh, a few things. Primarily, uh, it's a, an abstraction on top of Ceph. And the team behind uh, Rook at Quantum has actually been heavily contributing to the Ceph project upstream and has actually uh, initially built an embedded version of Ceph that can run on uh, different distributions that natively make use of the primitives in Ceph or actually uh, uh, try and run Ceph on, on different devices. Um, and so uh, Rook is actually based on that, uh, that uh, implementation of embedded Ceph called CephFS. And uh, it's basically production ready as of, uh, I think, the middle of last year, the CephFS version. Being based on Ceph itself, of course, which is t almost 20 years old and has been used in production for many, many years, 15, 15 plus years, uh, probably some of the largest uh, object block file storage clusters out there uh, run on Ceph. Uh, you know, it's an exabyte scale storage system, which is pretty awesome. And Rook uh, uh, is, is really built to solve a couple of key problems. One, Ceph itself hasn't really been built uh, over the last you know, 15, 20 years for the types of distributed, uh, constantly failing, ephemeral, multi-core architectures that exist today in the sort of modern cloud-native world. Uh, where people are actually distributing services and data across multiple cloud providers, across multiple geographic regions, across large compute clusters. And uh, even though Ceph was used in that, in that kind of context uh, in, the, in, the, in the beginning, since it's distributed, uh, a lot of the, the challenges of maintaining and operating and upgrading and patching and doing uh, various sort of care and feeding activities in Ceph itself are really hard. And so people uh, have kind of shied away from, from using Ceph for a lot of the, the modern types of purposes. And so uh, what Rook is all about is basically kind of raising the abstraction away from uh, the, the native Ceph interfaces to, to provide uh, much more operator and application developer friendly um, sort of uh, primitives. And we'll, and we'll talk a little bit about those. Um, uh, Ceph uh, obviously also has a lot of different moving parts and components and, and agents and demons that, that actually provide this, this sort of unified uh, object block and file storage um, capability. And uh, what Rook uh, also does is sort of simplifies that into a single, uh, single binary. So you can actually download uh, Rook and de de deploy that as a, a container-based service in your cluster. On Kubernetes, today it works, and you can also run it standalone. Uh, in the future, you'll run it on, on Swarm and Mesos and Cloud Foundry and other, other systems. So it's designed to sort of be uh, universally uh, deployable across all these different frameworks. Um, but it's very simple to, 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 to deploy and very simple to maintain, which is kind of one of the big advantages over just using Ceph uh, itself uh, natively for this sort of thing. Um, one of the other really huge benefits um, is it's not rewriting the, the data path. Um, so you know, what that means is you know, lots of these newer systems that are, that are coming out, whether it's sort of from the converged infrastructure vendors you know, selling a physical appliance with their software layer and their control plane, they're actually rewriting the way um, uh, you know, bits actually get written to disk uh, in, in terms of the, 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 the low-level software and uh, you know, things that actually interface with, with the Linux kernel drivers and, and the whole data path uh, that, that we heard about earlier. And, and to actually rewrite a data, a data path from scratch in the beginning uh, is incredibly uh, difficult, and it takes many, many years of hardening and many years of production sort of performance and experience to make something really stable. Um, and so that's why Rook is sort of kind of the best of both worlds. You have something that is very proven, so you don't need to really worry about the data path uh, production readiness, but you also have something that works really well in the sort of modern application architectures that are, that are kind of very popular today. Um, <clears throat> So to talk a little bit more about Rook itself, um, I mentioned it gives you this unified file uh, block and object storage. Um, this is very nice, so you don't have to sort of evaluate different systems for these different types of needs and, and, and purposes. Um, it, it gives you this ability to run uh, uh, local storage on the instances or compute nodes that you're actually running your applications on and to actually make, make use of those resources that sometimes are often underutilized. 
Um, so for example, if you're running on uh, EC2 instances <coughs> that actually have a fair bit of <coughs> uh, provisioned local storage attached to those, to those uh, virtual machines, uh, oftentimes if you're you know, starting to spin up EBS volumes or EFS, uh, uh, or uh, S3 buckets or what have you, you, you actually waste a lot of the, the, the local storage on those instances um, you know, without even really knowing it. Um, and so that, that's, that's something that a lot of people don't think about. One of the, one of the more immediate benefits uh, on the hyperscale, hyperconverged thing is um, Rook is really great for people just running bare metal on physical data centers. Um, I know, you know lots of the hyperscale companies like Facebook own and run a lot of their data centers because they have very specific, sophisticated needs from their, from their hardware and from their network and so on. Um, but also a lot of other companies in you know, more common industries that aren't big hyperscale internet companies run physical private data centers still today, even though a lot of people are moving to cloud, they're still, you know, the, the vast majority of compute is still running in private data centers that are owned and, and managed by companies. Um, and so Rook actually provides a very nice um, alternative to the, the, the things that you would expect in a cloud provider like S3 and EFS and, um, and EBS in a private data center. So you don't really need to think too much about um, you know, different alternatives that are, are, are API compliant or have a lot of the similar functionality uh, to go and, and try and emulate services behind your, behind your physical uh, corporate firewall. So that's kind of interesting. Um, Rook is, 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 is also taking care of a lot of the management facilities behind the scenes, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about how that happens. Um, one of the really cool things here is, you know, as an operator, you don't really need to think about managing and maintaining all of the different distributed um, components inside of Ceph. Uh, you just sort of look at Rook, and it has all of those things automated away for you underneath, and you, know, you, know, you don't really need to kind of have dedicated uh, storage uh, operations engineers or reliability folks dedicated to sort of large Ceph uh, deployments. Um, obviously, it's distributed, it's replicated, it gives you this elasticity. You simply add more nodes to get more storage. Um, it's as simple as that. And it, it'll run directly either on, uh, on commodity machines or you can you know, purchase and build your own you know, high-performance specialized hardware and it'll run fine on that as well. Uh, the purpose is, is for you to basically take advantage of local storage running on commodity x86 machines, uh, which can either be from you know, white box vendors or just you know, from Dell, EMC, what have you. Um, so these are some of the bigger sort of key points uh, behind Rook. Um, the project is very young. It's uh, in terms of the control plane, which is written in Go, uh, not yet production ready, but uh, I think Block is the first uh, interface that's going to be production ready in the next couple of months. Uh, as I mentioned, the data path, which is based on Ceph, uh, is fully production ready. Um, but the project is, is starting to get a lot of, uh, a, a lot of uh, exciting popularity. And the, the vanity metrics on GitHub are, 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 are showing, uh, uh, showing that for sure. Uh, so the project is about five months old, um, 1,100 stars. Right now, we're seeing about 25 to 30,000 um, container pulls off of the, the Quay, Quay registry where all the images are, uh, are stored uh, every day, which is, which is great. And uh, any of the, the changes actually made to Ceph throughout the lifecycle of Rook are merged upstream to the Ceph project uh, itself, uh, which is really useful since there's a very tight feedback loop and, and people actually make sure that if they're using Ceph natively, they actually benefit from a lot of the things that are found in the Rook community and the, and the, and the Rook users, which are starting to grow. Um, and so it's a pretty tight feedback loop between, um, between people uh, like Sage, who's the creator of, of uh, Ceph, uh, and many folks at Red Hat and other people in the community and, and the Rook development team. Um, and the, the Rook uh, engineering team is primarily based in Seattle, but uh, there's lots of, uh, uh, lots of different contributors uh, that are starting to, 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 to generate PRs and, and, and submit issues and actually contribute to the project, which is exciting to see. Um, so as I mentioned, Kubernetes is sort of the first uh, kind of focus area for making Rook run very well and reliably in a sort of modern distributed container orchestration runtime environment. Um, and I think that's one of the huge gaps in, in the Kubernetes community. So it's one of the things that got me personally excited about Rook. Uh, but this, uh, this is going to continue, and, and, and Rook will be supported across a variety of different systems, including Mesos, uh, CoreOS, and Docker. One of, the, one of the really cool things that's happening in the storage area right now, which is sort of the boring, kind of reliable thing that everyone expects to work, but is actually really hard and doesn't actually work until very much later on as projects mature, is uh, there's, a, there's a, a new initiative called the Container Storage Interface, or CSI, and all of these orchestration ven vendors or projects are actually starting to adopt CSI as a sort of common set of primitives and interfaces for 
um, standing up, starting, restart, uh, starting, stopping, snapshotting, and, and doing a variety of operations with volumes and with different um, interfaces and protocols that actually mount and, and, and attach and detach data and so on from different, um, from different uh, storage systems and from different hardware providers. Uh, and so that's really cool to see um, in the same way that we're starting to see standardization around the container image format and the runtime. Uh, we're starting to see uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of alignment and consensus across these different competing communities uh, for storage, which is really great. Um, so talking a little bit about uh, the, the, the Kubernetes um, support, which is the sort of, uh, as I mentioned, the sort of initial uh, focus area for, for Rook. Um, I could talk a lot about Kubernetes, but I'll just talk briefly, and then we'll talk about operators and sort of how uh, the operator design was, uh, was conceived and how it works for, for Rook. Um, so as, as most of you mentioned, uh, raised, raised your hands, you're familiar, you've, or you've been using Kubernetes. Uh, I won't talk too much about it, but Kubernetes is basically designed for this very ephemeral, constantly failing, uh, distributed world of compute uh, machines that uh, obviously support distributed applications, which are becoming more and more, po more, more popular. And uh, you know, as, as, as the sort of pets and cattle analogy goes, Kubernetes was designed for cattle. And so in this, in this sense, um, you know, Kubernetes hadn't really uh, designed or, or conceived of primitives to support stateful storage-based apps from the very beginning. It was very, very focused around web, stateless, kind of live, constantly um, served uh, applications to, to online users. And that, uh, and that sort of design pattern uh, has been the sort of the dominant structure. Uh, only until about the, the last 18 months or so has there been a lot of uh, focus in engineering development in the Kubernetes project to support um, things like identity and stable names and stable, um, uh, stable life cycling of, of, of different uh, components that allow you to run storage. Um, so, but fundamentally, Kubernetes is, is kind of around giving you this, this declarative API for uh, distributed services or dis distributed systems, really. Uh, which can mean a lot of different things. Uh, it gives you an API for handling how you replicate services, how you uh, handle uh, failure recovery, um, how you do upgrades of services, how you man manage service discovery and routing and networking between services, uh, and, and a long list of other things that, that, I, that I won't go into. Um, uh, Kubernetes has, uh, so thanks to the CoreOS folks, this idea of an operator. And operators are really, are really cool. I think it's a great idea that, that, uh, that was, that was uh, popularized fairly recently, uh, actually just before KubeCon Seattle last year, which I think was uh, around the October timeframe. Uh, so it's still a kind of a younger concept. Um, but the thing that's really awesome about operators is it basically takes this, um, this, this sort of initially narrowly focused optimization in Kubernetes, which is around the stateless kind of ephemeral um, cattle-oriented applications and allows, uh, op, uh, al allows Kubernetes users and Kubernetes workloads to actually um, become much, much more uh, reliable for things that, that actually depend on state and replication and durability and, and identity in the, in the cluster where things are still constantly, constantly failing. Um, and so this, this is actually a really great concept. It's also useful for stateless um, services, but we'll, t we'll talk about a few examples here. Um, so key value stores that actually need to maintain a quorum of, uh, of communication for, for replication purposes or for upgrades or for a variety of other reliability purposes um, actually need to have a certain identity and, um, and sequence of how those, those sort of quorums are maintained. Kubernetes itself is completely random in terms of the naming, in terms of the recovery uh, semantics and a variety of other things that actually sort of making a quorum consistently reliable across failures is, is by default impossible in Kubernetes. And so there's a set of primitives over time that have been sort of introduced that, that, that kind of allow you to hack around this. But uh, fundamentally, this idea of an operator kind of solves, solves for this in the most elegant way. Um, for databases, obviously, you want to make sure that if you have uh, a replica or a shard of data on a specific um, node with, with, with a volume that a container is, is actually uh, mount, mounting to, 
um, you, you certainly don't want that, uh, that container to fail and then come back with a completely different identity where it doesn't know where to find that volume, where it doesn't know where to attach the data, or it doesn't know how to basically maintain a, a consistent identity between where the container is and where the volume is. And so uh, operators actually solve for that as well uh, in, in, in some clever ways. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about the operator pattern and sort of why it was conceived um, and, and sort of what it means at a lower level. Um, I apologize if this is a little bit of a, of a repeat from what Ivan uh, presented on earlier. I wasn't, I wasn't at his talk, so uh, I, I tried to not. Actually, it was sort of intentional because I didn't want to get influenced by your, your genius, so, uh, but I will watch it later. Um, an operator is basically a collection of a few Kubernetes primitives. Um, it's fundamentally a custom controller. And so in Kubernetes, we have this idea of controllers. Uh, there's a very common one called a replication controller, which is a sort of original idea of you know, stamping out a bunch of copies of an application or, or a sort of a web front end or some kind of you know, piece of, 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 a, of a service that uh, represents some core functionality. And you know, that replication controller would just always make sure that you know, n number of copies were, were there in the cluster. So regardless of where they were, regardless of their name, uh, that, that sort of reconciliation uh, loop that you see on the right-hand side of sort of watching, watching the cluster, uh, analyzing where, where the current state is, and then making a change based on that current state um, is, is kind of the, 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 the sort of the state machine logic behind the controller model in Kubernetes. Uh, there's different types of controllers. There's a controller uh, for basically making sure that you have one of something on every machine. And so that's a daemon set or sort of a daemon-based um, controller. So systems that require uh, daemon-based software like file systems or, or, or uh, queues or other systems that are sort of distributed across uh, a cluster of computers, that's a very useful, useful pattern. Um, and then uh, uh, there's actually another controller called, um, now called a stateful set. It used to be called a pet set, but they changed the name because they didn't want to offend people who were sort of, you know, thinking that pets should actually be loved and not necessarily killed when the cluster dies, even though you want identity there. Uh, and so there was a lot of, like, uh, a, a, a lot of contention and argument in the community. So it's actually changed from pet set to stateful set. What a sta stateful set does is provides uh, a stable name for your pod or for your, for your application instance, uh, along, with, um, a, uh, 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 along with a stable association to where that, uh, where that application needs to run in the cluster. So if it run on a certain, ran on a certain node that has um, some, some, some specific um, parameter or some specific uh, property for providing storage or providing some CPU type or, or what have you, it'll always restart like on that specific uh, machine as part of that, that sort of definition of a stateful set. Um, and so there's different types of controllers. What an operator gives you the ability to do is create uh, a custom controller as well as a custom resource. And so in, in Kubernetes, we have this idea of, of resources for a variety of different, uh, for a variety of different things. You have, uh, you have a, an API for, for the whole cluster and you have a bunch of different resources for controlling how applications are deployed and lifecycle managed in the cluster. Um, what resources allow you to do is, prov is provide basically a common data model for how your application should uh, be represented and how it should behave um, on, a, on sort of a single, single association basis. The controller then takes that resource manifest, it's basically a simple uh, JSON YAML manifest, and it, it, it allows you to provide a, 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 a specific uh, lifecycle or controller mechanism against that resource. And combined, and you, and you can have multiple custom resources for a controller. So you can have multiple TPRs, or they're called third-party resources, uh, or external resources that you know, users create. Um, and so the operator is basically a combination of either you know, one or more TPRs and uh, a controller that basically you know, dictates how your how your application or how your service should, should, be, should behave or how it should be life cycled in, 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 in the cluster. Uh, and so that's, that's kind of one of the, uh, one of the, the crucial components of, uh, of operators. Um, any questions at all on, on that? This is, uh, this is kind of one of, the, one of the newer parts of Kubernetes that folks are often curious about. No? So I'll keep going there. 
Um, so we'll give you a few examples of some operators that exist today. Um, when when CoreOS came out with this idea of operators, they launched two operators, one for etcd and one for Prometheus, uh, which is the uh, very popular um, uh, sort of uh, time series based monitoring, eventing, and and uh, visibility uh, uh, system that allows you to get some some really interesting metrics and um, triggers out of your distributed apps, and and, and it gives you some really nice uh, monitoring uh, visualization uh, functionality. Uh, etcd is obviously very popular, so we don't have to talk too much about that. Uh, what the etcd operator does that that uh, the CoreOS folks created was it creates um, it basically allows you to declaratively against that custom operator create or stamp out etcd clusters. Um, and so if you didn't have this operator, you would have to go through a lot of sort of gymnastics to figure out how to best, like not, not only best uh, represent and deploy a complete and functioning etcd quorum in your cluster, but actually like upgrade it how do you make sure that those nodes come back with the same set of registration and identity? How do you make sure that they can actually be upgraded properly? How, you can, how can you do backups and so on? Uh, and so the operator automates all of that. Uh, and it gives you a, a custom controller that's created by these third party resources um, and, and the custom controller there to basically declaratively say, I want a new cluster. I want to grow the size of the quorum. I want to back up the data. And it gives you these like, higher level controls to be able to do that that uh, declaratively, which is really awesome. Uh, in terms of um, just a quick snapshot here, this is the, the custom uh, resource or third third party resource um, uh, sort of uh, controller type that, uh, that you would provide here. So you would say, here's my example. I want to get three, uh, uh, you know, three, three nodes that are desired and I have my version, my, my specific version that I want to run. And through the, the, the Kubernetes client, uh, uh, command line client, you would just say, I want to create this replica, replica set. And the pod, uh, uh, the pod count in the environment and the labels that you set are uh, obviously uh, d defined in your configuration there. And then uh, once, the, once the API server starts recognizing that those, those pods need to be created based on this manifest that you've passed to the, to the command line, it'll start creating those. And you can control the lifecycle in the same way that you would control uh, replica sets or daemon sets or other, other types of controllers. And so you now have like a, a, a very specific um, controller for a specific app and you can, be, you can be really certain about how the sort of uh, the application is managed over time uh, based on the, the, the primitives that Kubernetes provides. So this is, this is really great functionality. I think it's going to solve a huge number of problems for, for people looking to run more complex um, applications on Kubernetes without um, needing to worry about all of the all of the custom semantics that they need to, to kind of wire together. Uh, in order, oops, I think I kind of talked about that one already. Um, so the Rook operator is somewhat similar in, in terms of the, the design philosophy and the use case as the etcd operator. It's a stateful system. Uh, it stores data. So etcd is a stateful you know, key value store for doing uh, sort of cluster metadata synchronization and, 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 uh, and, and consensus and locking and doing a bunch of other things. And uh, it, it, you know, it's, it's similar in the way that you, know, you don't, you don't want to lose data. You don't, you don't want to make sure it's reliable. It's, it's important that this system has certain identity characteristics. And so Rook is, uh, as I mentioned, a distributed um, object lock file storage system based on Ceph that provides uh, distributed storage to applications running in your cluster. Um, what this Rook operator does is it basically takes, um, takes the, all the stuff components that Rook kind of abstracts for you, which are running in containers now, and actually runs them as a native sort of Kubernetes service on the cluster, which is extremely useful. Um, so this, this Rook operator is relatively new. It's been, it's been in, in the works and in development for the last, I think, three, four months. Uh, basically since the beginning of, of the Rook project. So the sort of thought and, and, and the conception around Rook, Rook was, was, was pretty focused around building a first class operator from, from the early days. Um, and we can talk a little bit about what, what the life cycle of this specific Rook operator provides. Um, so once you, uh, once you basically create this, uh, this Rook operator and deploy the uh, configurations on your cluster, and I'll show a quick demo of that at the end, um, you, uh, you can expect uh, 
a variety of things to happen. And there's, there's different primitives in Kubernetes for specific things that as a developer, or frankly, even as an operator, in many cases, you shouldn't have to worry about or, or know about. I think over time, these things are kind of going to disappear as the Linux kernel primitives have sort of over time disappeared for application developers, maybe sometimes like not, not, not so positively, like they should know about certain things and certain, certain calls and functions that they should, they should take advantage of. But um, Kubernetes is, 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 is providing a lot of these really powerful primitives. So in the first stage here, um, what this work operator is providing is, is basically the creation of a deployment. And what a deployment does is it creates a replication count of a certain pod template. And so in this case, there's an API service, a RESTful API service that allows uh, application developers or people in the, in the cluster to talk to Rook directly. And so that's the RESTful API service. The second thing that it does is it starts and manages uh, the, the Ceph quorum itself. And so the Ceph monitor uh, is pretty important for making sure that you have visibility into all the different blocks and uh, storage types that are basically getting that are basically getting uh, replicated across the cluster for all the distribution and sort of finding and sort of um, uh, communication of, of, uh, of the data in the cluster from the client perspective. Um, and then once that's done, uh, the OS Ceph OSDs are created on each node in the cluster through a daemon set. So remember we talked about these different types of controllers. So those are actually absorbed and taken care of and sort of selected and, and defined for you in advance just by uh, deploying this operator on the cluster. Uh, and the daemon set for the OSDs is basically saying for, for the OSD um, you know, daemon, we want to run one uh, per node. So we have each, uh, each OSD agent running on every node in the cluster. So you can have uh, you know, object storage available to the cluster. Right? Uh, and you can actually apply labels on those uh, pod templates for the OSD uh, daemons, so you actually know where they're running. You can actually health, uh, health check them and manage them and replace them and upgrade them and so on uh, through the API server itself, which is really, which is really useful. Um, the, the fourth uh, step here in the, uh, in the Rook operator is, uh, is the creation of the actual object store, RGW, with another deployment and another replica set. And this uh, also listens to the load and, 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 and understands kind of based on all the different um, uh, connections and reads and writes and so on to actually add or, or, or remove uh, potentially the replicas of that specific, uh, of that, of that specific service. Uh, and then finally, the, uh, the MDS uh, file system nodes are actually deployed as a, as, a, as a deployment in Kubernetes as well. And so all these things are kind of taken care of for you behind the scenes. Normally, without an operator, this would be quite a lot of work. You have to figure out how to write the, 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 the configuration you know, manifests for your deployments, for your daemon sets, for your controllers, for, you know, for your, for your, uh, for your, uh, for your uh, daemon sets and, and, and deployments and so on. And that's quite a lot of work, but you also have to understand Ceph. You have to understand like, the, 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 the deployment models, like where the agent should run, in which sequence, in which order. There's like, a lot of institutional knowledge kind of baked into that, or specific uh, service uh, knowledge that you, know, you, you, you now really don't have to think about. Uh, and you, all you have to do is really just trust that this operator is going to sort of encapsulate a lot of that for you uh, reliably. Um, and so this is, this, is pretty, this is pretty nice and pretty useful. Um, and of course, this is the, the sort of the basic flow of, of, an, of an operator uh, in, in, in Rook. Um, getting to a little bit more specifics on how Rook works as, uh, as a system. Um, you know, it's, it's again deployed as pods. So the, the Rook system itself uh, has a variety of components, which, which again use Ceph, so the, the OSDs. Uh, running on each node, um, the, the monitoring agent, MDS, RGW, all of the, all the different pieces, the, the RESTful API that we mentioned. Um, and so it's all running on the cluster as a set of containers, as a set of pods. And Kubernetes uh, applications themselves basically directly mount those uh, block devices or file systems managed by Rook uh, natively. And they can also use um, native, and so it's, it's also S3 API compliant. Uh, or Swift API compliant, so you could be using something like OpenStack or something like AWS S3. Be familiar with those interfaces and uh, API calls, and they'll work just uh, just the same. Uh, of course, the the REST API service that we mentioned uh, is is available, and it's also exposed through a command line tool uh, that's 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 offered in the service. Um, the Rook 
operator itself has a, a single container binary, and so you can actually deploy that down as, uh, as, a, single, uh, as a single service on the cluster and basically bootstrap and monitor the, the entire cluster itself. Um, and once things are requested through the API, you, know, you basically start a deployment, uh, you have a shared file system, and, and you have your, your, your services available to you. Um, and so this is, this is all pretty uh, well designed. Some of this um, is changing based on the, the, the maturity, um, based on the maturity and the, um, uh, and the, and the development of third party resources in Kubernetes, which again are, are fairly uh, new. I think, I think they're about a year old, but they're, they're just starting to get uh, past, um, I think, a beta release, and they're not, they're not quite production ready yet. I, I believe they're in beta. They might be alpha, but I, th I think they're in beta. Um, in, in Kubernetes 1.7, that might be changing, which is coming out in, in, in a couple months. Um, so, so this is just a quick snapshot of the, of the Rook architecture. And again, you, you, can, you can expect that you have this ability to provide um, native uh, clustered object uh, block and file storage to your applications running on Kubernetes without really needing to think about which other systems to evaluate. Um, and I, obviously, if you're running on a, on a bare metal cloud, you have these sort of great alternatives to the public cloud services that you use very commonly. Even if you run on uh, EC2, frankly, I think there's a lot of uh, value for using something like Rook, because you don't actually have to write natively to uh, the types of services that would effectively lock you into a cloud provider or maybe uh, sort of rob you of utilizing your local storage that's running on your instances uh, where your applications are. So uh, there's a few things to think about there. Um, uh, as far as the roadmap, as I mentioned, this is a, a fairly new early project. Uh, there's there's fail failover is, is getting implemented now. I think there's a, a PR for that. Uh, upgrades uh, itself are, uh, are also under, under development. Uh, and there's, there's also a few other TPRs that are getting developed for uh, for different parts of, uh, uh, of the Ceph cluster for, for de describing topologies, for selecting which, which nodes to run certain storage components on, and uh, to control which other devices and directories are, are used. So the, the project is very active. Uh, I, I think there's about 15 or so people working on it full time from, from Quantum. Uh, there's a few other folks that have started to contribute to it externally. Uh, and the project is, is, uh, is you know, getting a lot of use in, 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 in momentum. Um, so lots of lots of people contributing to it, uh, almost uh, uh, you know, in terms of just sort of issues and and and, and variety of other things. Um, that's the main kind of presentation. I did have uh, a brief demo. Uh, I'm, I'm a little worried about how do I switch to the. Uh, uh, well, let's just see if I. Okay. So I was too wimpy to do a live demo. I'm not Kelsey Hightower. It's a good friend and very brave, amazing person. But um, this will loop. This is just giving you an example of how, how easy it is to deploy Rook on a Kubernetes cluster. There's a couple of dependencies that you need uh, available in the cluster. You need to have, uh, you need to be able to have the kubectl client uh, CLI uh, be able to talk to mod, uh, mod probe. And you need to have uh, RBAC, I think you have to have that turned off. And a couple of other things uh, need to be configured. But essentially all you do is um, once you have those, those sort of basic parameters set up, uh, whoops. Yeah. Hey, you just ah, I see. Yeah, so we can make it slightly smaller than. So I was outside the room, but. Yeah. Uh, Our control minus. Ah. Yeah, that's that how we do it. Ah, that's okay. <laughs> so actually, let's ah, okay, see so if we can. Is there, is there, is there? Yeah, I just wanted to. Um, now, now okay. All right, there we go. Um, so once you have the the uh, the, the operator uh, op, the operator and um, uh, the uh, cluster manifests uh, available, um, <clears throat> it's it's as simple as and, and once your Kubernetes cluster has those dependencies in place, uh, it's as simple as creating a couple of very simple manifests and uh, and you have your Rook cluster uh, available. Uh, and so the the goal is to have this very simple like two command, three command uh, bootstrapping <coughs> uh, deployment uh, also uh, possible on Docker Swarm, on Mesos, on Cloud Foundry and other systems. Uh, so it's not just specific to Kubernetes. But uh, of course, because Kubernetes is sort of the, you know, I think unquestionably the sort of dominant, uh, you know, container uh, runtime operating system for distributed systems, uh, this is sort of the, the focus area initially. So. Um, 
that's kind of all I had. Uh, didn't uh, didn't want to take too much more time on on, on this. A any any questions uh, from folks? I'm happy to take. Thank you, Joseph. Okay. Come on. There's got to be one question in there. Just, no? just before beer. Just know. before beer, I know. Like, I'm holding everybody back. Everybody back from getting drunk. <laughs> We'd rather ask him on the beer. Yeah, cool. Thanks for having me. Guys, if not, Joseph, thank you so yeah. much. Yeah. Sure? Ah. Oh, you got a question from Alex. <laughs> <laughs> So I asked you this question yesterday, but uh, now that you are in front of the, of the audience, perhaps you are going to reply to it. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, thanks. No, I had to lie to you. No last problem. Time. I don't know what your question was. So, what, what's your plan being on Rock now to introduce the, this to people that uh, will need it, and uh, how will you find the people that really need Rock in their systems? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that that's going to happen organically. It's an open source project. Um, people will, I think, sort of learn more about it and hear more about it as the community develops. Um, so the, qu the question was for the, the video and everything, like, how will people who maybe don't know they have a problem and that Rook might solve it, like how will they learn about Rook and how will they realize that this will solve a specific problem? Is that fair, Re yeah. accurate re repeat of your question? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that that'll happen organically. You see, the really cool thing is this is open source software, 100% open source. Uh, it's based on Go and, and Ceph and so, um, <clears throat> it, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a really exciting and interesting area. I think storage is one of the really big unsolved um, problem spaces for the sort of container industry right now. Uh, in particular with Kubernetes, there's lots of offerings and lots of ways to get around this. Um, but for, for sort of a single system to provide all these different interfaces and sort of the native uh, lifecycle um, components that we talked about in operators, I don't, I don't think anything quite exists yet. So as these things mature and become more proven, uh, I think people will start to, to see how it's useful and, and, and actually uh, adopt it more. But we're already starting to see that happen organically quite a bit, so. Sure. Anyone else? Anyone else? No, cool. All right, thanks. Thank you so much. No